locked and loaded, and then I see a mushroom cloud in the distance. And then the, my first thought was, holy shit, that's the front gate. And it was the front gate. So it turns out that there was a convoy directly behind us that got hit with a 2,000 pound V-bid and it killed everybody inside. Uh, my name is Paul Pang. I served in the U.S. Army. Was in from 2000 to 2009. I got out as an E5 sergeant. So I was born in Taiwan, came here when I was one. So basically I was here. My childhood, I grew up in Monterey Park. I don't really, really remember much about my child, to be honest with you. Um, I, I know I played around a lot. As a teenager, though, I got into a lot of trouble. So I was the typical troublesome teenager kid. I would always sneak out in the middle of the night, go to parties or hang out with girls because that was a thing that was, you know, that teenager boys did back then. Got into a lot of trouble, got into a lot of fights. Ironically speaking, I was actually still able to keep my grades up. I'm not even sure how I pulled that off, but I did. That was basically the gist of my childhood. <laughs> Honestly, so this is probably going to surprise a lot of people, you know, like most people like they, they, they join because of the school money or because of patriotism or willing to do, to, to do something that's meaningful in life. I actually just did it to piss off my parents. There wasn't a patriotic bone in my body. I didn't do it for, for, for monetary reasons. I didn't do it for the GI Bill. I literally did it to piss off my parents. Realistically, I, I, just, I just wanted to get out of the house. If that was the case, I would have joined the active military, but instead I joined the reserves. So it wasn't really out of the house. I went, to, I, I went away for basic training, but that was about it. He didn't necessarily lie to me because back when I joined, it was prior 2001. So I was a military police. Um, I decided to do that because at one point in my life, I wanted to be a police officer. That's why I picked that. So there was no war going on. And realistically, what he said about one week in a month, two weeks out of the year was technically true, which was the case actually when I first joined up because I, I, I was part of the delayed entry program. So I actually went to my unit before I went to basic for about six months, I think. So I was still in high school. I graduated high school and then I went into, I remember this, I went to first day of basic training was at Fort Leonard, Missouri, July 4th, 2001. That was always interesting to have like, you know, the drill sergeant like up on you the entire time, pretty much. Uh, I remember the first day, it was like two o'clock in the morning and we're at Fort Leonardwood and uh, the, the drill sergeant walking out of the reception hall and all you hear is a bunch of oh shits and oh fucks and why did I do this is and they just kind of, I mean, they didn't say it out loud, but you can hear them whispering amongst themselves like people were just being scared shitless. A drill sergeant showing up with the, with the, with the, with the hat. The first thing I remember them saying was get off my bus. And it was in the reception hall. I remember my first fraternization story. So don't ever fraternize with a female soldier while you're in basic training. It doesn't work out well. Maybe the second, third week um, I was there and, you know, she was like passing love letters over to me. And then somehow what we're doing, you know, like when we go on BRM and then they do an ammo shakedown in case people take like ammo home or whatever. So they make sure that they do that. In the middle of that, I guess she had a letter in her pocket that she didn't let anybody know. So when the drill sergeants did a shakedown, they found the letter and it was addressed to me. So they called me and her in front of the entire formation and we low crawled through in the summer through high grass full of ticks in all of our gear. So I was like, and then after that, she still wanted to talk about, yeah, no, no, we're, we're done. I'm not doing this again. <laughs> I was like checking myself for ticks the entire night. My, my first day of, of basic training was July 4th, 2001 and 9-11 happened literally two months later. I just finished basic training. I was in the very first phases of my AIT. Because basic training, I think, was what, eight weeks or something like that? It was right in the beginning of my AIT when 9-11 happened. As a matter of fact, I remember exactly when that happened. We were called into the, the, the first story Bay Area and then pulled out this team from like the 1950s um, in the barracks. And uh, we, we were literally watching the news as, as one of the towers, the Twin Towers, was on fire. And then I was watched the second plane hit on live TV. And my entire reserve status just went out the window after that. <laughs> that day that 9-11 happened, we were supposed to get our very first weekend pass. And that, that's done. <laughs> we didn't go anywhere that weekend. Uh, we saw Abrams tanks just rolling down. Every, the entire fort got locked down. The AIT training was pretty fun. We had like this whole village that was simulated village where the, the base pretty much built an entire town. It was a shell of itself. And then we would do like simulation training, do like traffic stops and stuff like that. We didn't really do any tactical stuff because it was just how it was back then. You know, we weren't at a time of war. So a lot of the, a lot of the military police stuff that we did was actually based off of training for like garrison duty. Ironically, 
in my nine years in, I didn't serve a single day in garrison. For those of you that are listening that don't like military police, yeah, you, you don't get to hate me because I never pulled you over once. So I do remember, you know, like learning handcuffing techniques and processing people, you know, baton techniques, you know, how to do riot control. That was probably the only thing that we utilized when we're uh, during my first deployment was the riot stuff. And then we found out very quickly how like there's very, very, very big holes in in the riot control techniques that it taught you in basic. So I graduated 2001. I missed my deployment for my original unit when they went to Fort Bliss, Texas. So I, I missed the whole Afghanistan thing. Um, our unit was the 314th was activated to Fort Bliss and the unit there went over to Afghanistan, What I, I believe. So they did garrison, but I, by the time I got back, they had already deployed. So I was in that little lull period where I was one of like maybe 14 people there where the entire unit was gone. So I was there for about a year. And then in 2000, January, 2003, I remember this exactly. I was with my ex-girlfriend at the time. I was walking up to, I was a new suicide. I was walking up to get ready to take a midterm exam. And as I'm walking towards the class and I'm late at this time, my cell phone goes off. Hey, report to, re report to base 314 tomorrow, 6 a.m. Okay, we're being, we're being activated to go to war. Wait, what? So I hang up the phone and then I tell my, my ex-girlfriend at the time and she f just balls out, just flat out balls out crying, right? Literally not even kidding, like 30 seconds later, get another call. Hey, report to the unit tomorrow, 6 a.m. We're, we're, we're being mobilized for, 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 for deployment. Shit, hang up the phone. Two minutes after that, another phone call. Hey, did you hear we're getting deployed? I'm like, stop calling me, I got it already. <laughs> right? I got like six of these calls within like a matter of five minutes. And all I'm wa while I'm walking towards uh, taking the exam, which I'm already late for, and I see the professor right in front of me, and he's waiting for me to get in there. And I show up to him, like, hey, and I told him, hey, I forgot his name, but I'm like, hey, professor, just uh, I, can I just skip the exam? I just got a phone call saying I'm being mobilized for to, to be deployed. I don't know where. I'm assuming it's Iraq, but I don't know where, right? Because back there, in January, it was still Bush and all that talking. They didn't officially say we're invading Iraq, but if I'm being mobilized as a reservist, it's a pretty good chance it's happening. So he understood. He goes, that's fine. Uh, UC Riverside was extremely helpful. They refunded me everything that I paid for that, that semester. They, they even refunded the books for crying out loud. And they guaranteed me a spot when I came back to, to be accept, uh, accepted back into the university. I was 19, about to turn 20, I think. I was scared shitless, man. I ain't gonna sit there and lie to you. Um, but I, I remember my, there was a specific point where my dad was like, yeah, you're not going. Because at first I got the orders and then I officially got the orders saying, okay, these are your orders to deploy. Like, you know, I've never seen an, an activation order before. You know, you look at movies and stuff, it's like, oh, you know, it looks all fancy. No, it's literally just a type sheet of paper that says you're being deployed for set amount of time, undetermined, da, 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 everything was, my, my initial deployment was only supposed to be 180 days. At least that's what my initial order said. Didn't end up being that, it ended up being a year. But I remember my, when, when, when my dad first saw that, he was like, yeah, you're not going. I'm like, you want to tell the president of the United States that I'm not going? Because I'm going, because if not, I'm going to prison, <laughs> right? So my, my, I remember my grandmother was crying all night. My mom was crying all night. It, like my brothers were too small back then. I think they were only like 11 or 12. So they didn't really fully understand anything that was going on. Yeah, that was, that was a crazy ass few, few weeks. So we went to Fort Bliss to mobilize. So we, I, think, I can't remember how long we were there for. I think it was like 30 days. Uh, we were training up to being retrained to, 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 to deploy. And we didn't even get, like we lived in barracks. And I remember like we didn't even get like proper armor. Like we got flak jackets from the Vietnam War. That was our body armor. We didn't even have like plates or any of that. Basically, if we got shot with anything more than a nine millimeter, we'd, we'd just be dead. I remember we were, were flying on the plane and everybody was so so thankful, so patriotic, the, the stewardesses and everything else. I thought we were flying on a military plane. We ended up flying on a civilian airliner straight into Kuwait. I didn't, uh, you know, because you watch all these movies, everybody gets deployed in a military jet. But in reality, it's like, no, you fly on a civilian airliner and then you fly into Kuwait. We're at, we landed at Camp Erevshan. The war started while we were there. I do remember though, while we were living in like a whole Bay Area, I had the top bunks so the lights were like bright as freaking crap. I remember one day we were, we were, we were always trained to put our gas mask on and I never took it seriously. Uh, probably should have. But any single time we heard the words like lightning, 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 it meant that Saddam Hussein launched another scud towards us and we had like to put our gas mask on. And it's kind of funny, like I, I can tell that when the first time I heard it, I just literally put it on as fast as I could. And then I look around and we were the only ones putting it on, which probably let me know that everybody else has been around for a long time. And we're like the, 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 the new guys, right? That were just super scared. I think a few of you guys laughed. 
But we still ended up putting it on. I remember that one time, and the, 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 I remember hearing lightning, lightning, lightning all the time. So that's let you know how many times Saddam launched a scud towards our direction. Good news for the scuds is that they're not they're not accurate at all, right? They don't usually hit where they want to. I remember one time specifically, it was at nighttime. I, I was I had my 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 Walkman on, and I was listening to uh, Jimmy Eat World. That was the, the song that was playing. I forgot what song it was, but it was the band. And I remember that nobody that there was no lightning, lightning, lightning. It was at night, I don't exactly remember what time it was. All of a sudden, I, I just hear this gigantic boom and the building just shakes like no other. And then I, I was just like, holy shit. My, my head is here and the gas mac is, is on the opposite side of the bed. Because by this time, I'm just as complacent as everybody else, right? I'm like, I'm not putting the shit on. But that one time, I don't hear the lightning, 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 right? Or maybe maybe our Patriot, battles, Patriot missile batteries failed or whatever, but the scud hit. It didn't hit us, but it was close enough to where I can see the lights flickering and the building shake like violently. And I was on the top bunk, which meant that if the ceiling collapsed, I'd be the first one to die, <laughs> right? So I, I remember I grabbed my mask and I, and I literally like put it on and sealed it within like probably, I don't know, four seconds. It was the quickest I've ever done it, but I was just like, what the hell is going on? People run outside and they see this gigantic mushroom cloud probably in the distance, not too far away. And it turns out, I, I think it was uh, the Scud missile that hit a, a Kuwaiti market, I think it was. I think it was, it was all over the news for a while. I don't remember exactly when, but I remember seeing it all over the news. I'm like, holy shit, that was that marketplace that nearly missed us by like, not that much. <laughs> so we were at Um Qasr. So that was um, the port city of Um Qasr. We, we went, that was our first mission. We we're taking over a prison camp, Camp Buka. So I remember, I know like some of the people that went to Camp Buka, but they was like, oh yeah, I went there. It was all set up. It was nice. I'm like, no, we were there when there was fuck all there. There was like dirt and dirt, dirt. That, that was it. There's nothing there. They were constantly in a wire. Our company took it over from the British Dragoons, right? That's how, that's, that's literally, we were, we were the first American personnel to take over the base from the British and take over prison operations there. While we were there, we, we had, you know, MKTs. We didn't have a chow hall yet. By the time I left after, after, after like two and a half months later, there was a chow hall there. But in the beginning we were eating out of MKTs. I'll never forget eating, eating a meal out of an MKT with a sandstorm going. And I'm, every time I'm, I'm eating on food, I'm eating sand with my food. So that's, it's, you know, it's an amazing experience. While we were there, I, we were involved in several prison riots. One of, they're all really bad. And ironically, it wasn't even the soldiers that gave us issues, it was the civilians that did. And we ended up having to separate the boys from the men because the men would rape the boys inside the prison camp. So we actually had to pull the, physically pull the boys away from the men and put the boys in its own separate camp away from the civilians and the soldiers. Soldiers never gave us a single freaking lick of issue the entire time. All the riots were because of the civilians. Not once was it the soldiers, the Iraqi army essentially. And the best part about it was, was that it kind of irked me a little bit because we had MREs most of the time. The freaking prisoners ate better than we did. They had three square meals a day. They had cigarettes and they had tea, ap chai, tea afterwards, right? So I'm like, wait, how the hell do they get better food than we do? What's, what's wrong with this picture? They got three square meals a day and they had a shower. It was a gravity fed shower, but they had, I didn't have a shower. I, I, I was literally, uh, I had to use baby wipes, right? So they had a shower, I didn't. So what are you complaining about? I do remember one specific one where it went completely crazy. So Camp Buka was the main holding cell. So as the coalition forces were, were, were advancing towards Baghdad, we took all the prisoners. I mean, I'm pretty sure there was more, but I, what I, from what I understood, Camp Buka was the main holding cell for all the POWs and civilian population, displaced civilian population. It literally just started off with like rock throwing. It would start from one side and would go to the other and it would just kind of go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Eventually to the point where everybody would just start going hoot and hollering, minus the, the military personnel. They just sat quietly. They never rioted the entire time, but it was still pretty much most of the camp that was rioting. They broke out of the, the, their, their, uh, their, their holding cells. They were making like shanks out of like the toothbrushes that were given to them by the American Red Cross. They would take the tent stakes out. They would pull that out and tie it to a two by four with you know the the string from the tent and they would make a spear out of it or they would just take out the two by four with a shower dismantle the shower completely and use the two by four with the nails sticking out of it as a weapon we were in riot gear and we were going inside i, re I remember we were going in riot formation and this is what when i told you earlier that we found our we found several holes in in the riot formations where basically they would just and it wasn't just like one person it was like hundreds of there was thousands of people there 
riding. It, was, it wasn't hundreds, it was thousands of people riding. One time I remember I was in the line and they literally pulled, it wasn't me, there was a guy next, it was a guy close to by me. A few guys, they, they would run into our shields, but a few of them, they would grab the shield and they would drag the person in. And the shields, it, was, it, was, it had a loop, right? Where you grabbed it like this, where there's a loop here and there was a handle. Well, when you get grabbed in, you don't have enough time to let go, you get dragged into the crowd. One of the guys, I can't remember his name, he got dragged into the crowd. Um, what I will say is this one person, he was a school teacher, his name was Sergeant Ng, NG, he's dead now, but he fired a shot from the perimeter that ended the riot. I, from what I remember, it was one shot. It, it hit dead center, the guy that pulled the guy and I was about ready to kill one of our guys I was on the floor in the middle of the riot. He falls backwards and just collapses on the ground. And the riot's over. And the minute somebody opened fire, the riot was over. And you, I remember watching the guy who was like gurgling blood. Like, it's not like in the movies where it's like, you know, it's like so dramatic. It's just, he was just literally having trouble breathing and he was gurgling blood and then he just ended up dying. The worst part was that Sergeant Ng, the one that saved the other soldier's life, he was interrogated like a POW for like, I think two days. Uh, the ironic part was he was, a, he was awarded a Bronze Star with Valor after that. So I think there's a lot of media interest as to why that happened. I do remember like after the riot though, Telemundo, CNN, Fox, NBC, like all these freaking media just showed up out of fucking nowhere. Like we're in the middle of freaking nowhere and all these guys like within half an hour just show up. And I remember specifically there was this one girl from Telemundo, she's wearing a white dress and heels trying to walk and run in the sand. I was laughing pretty hard actually. <laughs> We actually had police dogs um, that were in the back of cars. I was scared of them because every single time they would bring out the police dog, they, that stopped the last two riots, the first two. Because these dogs are like foaming at the mouth and they just wanted to like murder these people, you know? And I, I, was, I remember one time during one of the riots, I was standing next to the dog and I was kind of like, <laughs> going like, these dogs look mean, man. Uh, but it, it, two dogs held back an entire 1,000 people crowd Two dogs did what an entire company of MPs could hold back a crowd. We never had, like I said, we never had an issue with the soldiers. It was always, it was always the civilians, every single time. They were very polite. They were very professional. They never cussed. They were always handshake. They were very polite, courteous, everything. They, they showed soldier to soldier like we, were, we respected you. And they realized they were caught. And they realized they also got three meals a day, which under, when they were fighting the war, they didn't get crap. So they were happy to just sit there. Yeah, we were there for two and a half months. We got relieved. We went to we went we went back to Camp Arishan, and I remember remember we had, we hadn't showered in, in in like two and a half months, and all of our uniforms felt like cardboard because we sweat so much that you know the sweat just crystallized on the collars. And and I remember when we walked back, we had like litter. We had like an invisible shield around us because anytime we we we'd go up against somebody, we would smell so bad that they would just avoid us. That's why we had like we we had we jokingly said we had an invisible force shield around us. But we were we were sitting we were sitting down in barracks and we had a bed for the first time in like two and a half months. I remember the first time I took a shower, I thought I was just tan. Turned out I was just dirty. I had like all this like the water was black, and I remember sleeping in that bed for the first time in two and a half months with a clean set of uniforms on me that was freshly washed. It was like the best thing ever. And it's, it's kind of funny when you you think back, you kind of laugh now, but back 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 in those days, it's like when you when you don't have some of the basic necessities and you start enjoy it for the first time in two and a half months you like it's those little things you don't take for granted anymore i went to mosul for the rest of it i was in baghdad for like maybe a little bit but i was up in mosul for the rest of my deployment uh we were doing police operations so we're linked up with police stations to basically do like initial training but we're also doing prison operations it was this place called uh, mrcf mosul regional confinement facility at least that's what the nato people called it it was ironic because it was also a torture chamber for the, during the Iran Iraq war that Saddam used. Us being soldiers, you know, like we we were sick of eating MREs, so we would always bribe the um, the guys bringing in the food. You know, we would um, bribe them for like rice and chicken or whatever they would have that day. It's a hell of a lot better than eating MREs every single day, man. I'm telling you, after a while, it gets pretty 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 bad. <laughs> we did experience like like resistance, the part where like. We had, uh, uh, you know, like that was, that was when the IEDs first started coming out, but they weren't as prominent as during my second deployment. There were these, these IEDs were more like just Coke bottle bombs and something small, right? They would take a foot or a toe off of somebody, but it wouldn't like destroy a vehicle, at least not yet. By the time I was up in Mosul in that area, it was the very beginning of the resistance. Don't really remember much about anything else just outside of like doing prison operations out in, in, in the Mosul Regional Confinement Facility and this other 
youth prison camp and training uh, correctional officers during that time. It ended up being close to a year, 364 days exact. So it was just shy of a year. They, they cut it off right before they had to do something. Cause I guess once it hits a year, they have to pay like something extra or whatever. So they cut it off literally, I think it was like a day or two before. It was weird. Like I, I remember on that first deployment, I came back and uh, I was like depressed, man. After like the, like being, being like super happy for like the first two weeks after the first, after it kind of wore off, I was like super sad for a while. Um, and I couldn't figure out why, cause I didn't really know, I didn't know what PTSD was. I didn't know any of that shit was. I just remembered that I didn't want to talk to anybody and I was kind of sad. So what I did was I ended up burying myself in my, in my school studies. Ironically, before I left for deployment, my GPA at UCR was below 3.0. I mean, it wasn't like bad, but it was definitely not good, right? I, I just focused on my studies and I ended up graduating with a really high, I think it was like 3.6 or 3.5 GPA when I graduated with my bachelor's degree, only because I focused so much on my school because it was the only thing that kept me from thinking about other things, right? So, you know, like some people cope with alcohol, some people cope with this. I ended up coping with just studying a lot. I mean, I became an alcoholic too, but that was not as bad as my second deployment. My second deployment was a year and a half long. That was a, that was a bitch. The second one was a bitch. So the second time I was an E5, I became a sergeant. And the first time it was, it was a little bit easier because I only had to worry about myself and my team. The second time I was not only the, a sergeant, but I was also the alpha squad leader, which meant that if the squad leader died, guess who was in charge of the squad? This guy, right? So I had an entire squad to worry about because I, I was the assistant to the squad leader. We had armor, so thank God. We had armor, up armored vehicles the second time. We had body armor, legitimate body armor. But our primary thing was part of, we're, we're part of what's called a, the pit team, right? P a police transition team where we would go and we would live in one police station, but we, we were in charge of several police stations uh, in, our, in our AO. And what they would do is they would take the, take the company and split it into like, basically one company would be in charge of an entire province. We would have like a, an Iraqi interpreter with us, and we'd also have a, a a retired law enforcement official to do as a consultant, which in my in my opinion they didn't do jack shit. They were like like my guy was like in his at least looked like he was sixty something, probably three hundred pounds overweight, and didn't do jack shit and got and made two hundred fifty grand a year. We we could have easily done the job without him, but. The U.S. military loves spending money, so. The main reason on top of that is because we actually, because we're, we were a reserve unit, uh, we had a lot of active police officers that actually did the job. So we, like I said, we could have very easily done the job without the, the use of a retired 55, 60 year old dude that just slept all day. That's, that's actually what he did. <laughs> Nothing against the guy, but I mean, for him, I'm happy for him. He got a, he, he got a very easy gig, Never, hardly ever left the base. We would do like mounted patrols, dismounted patrols with the Iraqi police. And then what we would do is we would talk with local tribal leaders. And then we would, um, and my, my, my job on top of that was to take U.S. taxpayer dollars and basically say, you want a school, you want this, you want that. We'll give you the money to do the project for the, you know, basically infrastructure projects in exchange for information on where the enemy was. I just do my reports every day and, you know, whatever, whatever they, they get from that, they get from that. I'm not really sure. I don't really, I do know that uh, I, one of the reports, I'm not sure if it was what the one I did or somebody that my other uh, squad did, but it led to like a raid in our area. I mean, the people in that area were, I mean, especially we were in Fallujah for the first six months and then we were in Missoula for the last year. So we were in Fallujah and Missoula in 2008, 2009. We were there a lot longer. Ironically, um, I never fired my weapon once in the second deployment. Right, a lot of people are like, oh my God, you never fired your weapon? How, how were you there for a year and a half? I never, I'm like, I never, I never fired my weapon. I'm not gonna sit here and like lie to you, like, oh, you know, like over glorify myself. I'm like, that's just not what it is, I don't care. I just never fired my weapon. I've definitely been involved in situations where we had IEDs around us and one of them was damn near about to blow up in our face. I remember IED threats and EFP threats, the electronic form projectiles, those were much more of a threat by the time I got there the second time than the first time, because by the time they got to the second time, they found, they figured out that they can't, the insurgents couldn't engage us in direct combat. They would lose every single time. So what they would do, they would just blow us up. They would just harass us by blowing us up one vehicle at a time. And I remember this one particular time we were outside of the, uh, of the wall, we were in Mosul. I was in the middle vehicle on this one. We just barely leave the gate. And I see this Iraqi officer just kind of going like this, telling us to stop, right? So we stop and we ask him what's going on. And he was like, there, he was like, bomb, bomb, IED. And I'm like, where? And he literally points to my right. <laughs> and I look over and I'm, I'm the TC. 
truck commander and I literally look outside and I see this shiny object like barely in the glint in like the rubble and I'm like and then my eyes just I remember I, my eyes just went wide open like oh shit I'm gonna die right now I mean we had the warlock system on which is like a jamming system so I I don't know if that's what happened but I'm assuming that jamming signal stopped that ID from going off I'm gonna keep thinking that because it didn't go off but I remember our uh the, the person, it wasn't even our squad, it wasn't even my squad leader. I remember there was a specific person that, the person that was leading the convoy lost all military composure. I, he freaked out, bad time, really bad. He was just, instead of saying, you know, Bravo 1, Bravo 2, Bravo 3, whatever our call sign was back then, he would say Humvee, pull, fo pull forward. Well, there's three Humvees, which fucking Humvee are you talking about? Humvee, pull forward. Third Humvee, pull back. And, it, wait, what? He forgot my name. You know, so like you, you can see like the fear in his eyes and, you know, I mean, this particular individual was always like puffing up his chest about how tough he was. But I always never really fond of him. But in, in, when, it, when it came test time to, to test the metal, like he completely broke down. I ended up having it. I remember taking over because I couldn't nobody could understand what the hell they were talking. About. There was so much confusion and the bomb didn't even go off. The second time, like I said, it was a lot more IED heavy. I remember specifically there's this one time uh, we're up in Mosul and near the end of our deployment. And then this, this uh, actually there was two incidences. So the first one, it was, it was during the election. Uh, they were running for re-election and they were trying to hold free, uh, free and fair elections, right? And I say the word free and fair with, with quotes. And what ended up happening was um, our, our, our squad was, I'm pretty sure there was other squad, uh, every squad had their own mission, but our squad was to go to these, these checkpoints to collect the ballots, right? And we had two UN officials with us to do it. And, you know, when you think about UN officials, you're thinking about, oh, you know, they're nice and proper. You know, they're like, you know, you imagine like guys in suits and you watch too much Hollywood and stuff like that. But these turned out to be like two of the dweebiest looking dudes I've ever seen in my life. Like you ever see like, um, like Office Space Milton? That's like two Milton looking motherfuckers that show up and we're just like, these guys from the UN? You're like, totally not what I expect because you expect Hollywood and you're thinking like, but they look, the, you know, they even had like the, the, the large magnifying glasses. The scariest thing was that we had the mission to collect these ballots to go to 12 different points. And I remember hearing about a threat to our specific convoy saying that if we see U.S. soldiers going to these points, we're going to kill everybody there and, and the convoy. Direct threat from AQI, right? And I remember going there and I was just like, everyone was like on edge. The night before, I was so on edge. Because it's one thing to like walk, you know, go out the gate every day. And by the way, I went out the gate every single day. The second deployment, we didn't live on base. We lived in the middle of the city in Fallujah or in Mosul in these police stations. And so we we're always outside the wire. We only came back to the base to resupply with food and whatever else, we need ammo or what else. To actually be threatened, that was something else. Right? So we were extra prepared. Nothing ended up happening the next day though. That was the funny thing, nothing happened. Except for after we left the last uh, polling place, um, it was hit. So they waited for us to leave to hit the, the last, it was a school. They waited for us to leave and they hit it. Another one was uh, right before we came home, when soldiers that come back from base, they have to clear the weapons in the firing pit. And then once they clear the weapons, everything's all nice and go. They go into the front gate and you know we do our thing. I remember one time we were, we were doing that and uh, I came back, same, I was in Mosul, same thing, came back, wrote my report. I was on this little government computer thing and I was writing my report. I think I probably sat down for maybe like two, three minutes and the entire building shook. It was like a huge ass boom, like sonic boom thing. And then I go outside, I run outside with my rifle and my helmet. My body armor wasn't even on at this point because I was inside, I was in the base, so I took it off. I run out with my helmet and my, and my, and my rifle. I locked and loaded and then I see a mushroom cloud in the distance. And then my first thought was, holy shit, that's the front gate. And it was the front gate. So it turns out that there was a convoy directly behind us that got hit with a 2,000 pound uh, V-bid and it killed everybody inside. What was shitty, I think they were three days away from going home too. I think they were 72 hours away from like, phew, one of the last missions they get, they get killed. And it was literally right behind my convoy. So it was, I went in first they were the ones right after us, they got hit. And I always thought, I'm like, man, had I, not, had I just delayed it for a little bit, that could have been me. So a lot of close calls, and again, never fired my weapon, right? 2008, they don't fire at you anymore. They just blow you up. The second one was tough. You know, even though like, you know, I never fired my weapon, um, there was way more close calls in that second time. Because, you know, one, I was there longer, but two, it was, 
you know, imagine like, like you said, like playing Russian Lewitt every single time you leave the wire and you got to do that every single day. And it's for a year and a half. It gets to you. I became an alcoholic for oof, a while. I was a full blown alcoholic. I actually couldn't even go to bed without a gun underneath my pillow. Ironically, it was kind of, it was funny. It got so quiet when I got home that I always felt like somebody was watching me. So I, even though I'm in, I'm in my apartment and I'm always kind of doing this, even though it, it feels weird. Like every, I don't know if anybody can relate to this, but when I got so, cause I, I got used to, you know, used to going to bed with like gunfire and explosions off in the background, all of a sudden to just dead silence. And then you feel like something's always watching, watching you. So you're always kind of like doing this. That lasted for a while. Um, it went away eventually, but for the first, I think, few, few, three, four months, it was like that all the time. I'd have like constant nightmares, I had constant sweating. What finally got me to, to seek help after saying no for the longest time was she came in, it was a female at this time, it was my female roommate, and she came in because we had tandem parking. We were living in Hollywood and we had tandem parking, so, because there was one parking spot for two vehicles. So sometimes one's blocking the other, so we have to call to, to coordinate the whole moving out of all that stuff. I remember she came to my room and I was sleeping and I remember I was having a nightmare. She tapped me and I didn't have a gun at the time. I had a knife, right? So I would switch off between guns and knives and I pulled the knife out. I, I was almost charging at her for it. And then I realized in the middle of it, I dropped the knife and I was like, holy shit. And I just saw her eyes like big, you know, like deer in headlights look. She was like, you seek help or you're, I'm kicking you out which is understandable, right? And she was a good friend of mine too. So it was like, that was the first time seeking help. That was seven, eight months after I came back. That's how long it's, how long I waited. I was really angry for a long time. Um, I was divorced once. Uh, I, could, I couldn't hold down a relationship to save my life. In a way, I guess you can say that I'm still kind of that way. Like I don't have a problem finding a relationship. I just had a problem keeping it. Right. And it wasn't because I was, you know, was infidelitous or anything. I wasn't cheating on anybody. It was just, I had a lot of anger issues that I had to work out. And it was always, I would always respond with anger because that's all I knew. I mean, I remember I had to go to, I, dude, it took over 10 years of therapy for me to finally kind of take it down a notch. That's why I have this guy, right? And I had to, I had to wait three years for him, but I also had to go through, you know, interview after interview and, and proof upon proof about why I needed a service dog. And this guy, believe it or not, helped out a lot. I was on 26 different medications at one point. And it wasn't like I had that many issues. It was literally just, I had to take this for antidepressants. I had to take this for, for anxiety, but then they had side effects. So I had to take that medication to offset this side effect and this medication to offset that side effect. And then it just kind of added on top of each other. And as the VA goes, they just like to, med they just like to dose you with drugs. They don't really want to fix anything. It's more like putting a bandaid on an open wound. The wound doesn't actually stop bleeding, but it keeps the blood in. So the wound's still there, right? So they just kind of put a mask on it. You know, me getting this, this dog, I'm cutting it down to like probably as far as for, for like my PTSD and stuff, I'm down to one. Uh, it's, it's amazing that my liver and my kidneys still function properly. I'm, I'm actually really shocked. <laughs> I mean, I, I have like other stuff like cholesterol medication, you know, like um, I have like constant problems with allergies now. I like to attribute that to my time in the military because before that, I'd never had anything like that. I have a problem right now where I have like, I have to constantly clear my throat a lot and the doctors can't find out what's wrong with it. I've literally been in the VA probably about nine or 10 times, ear, nose, throat specialist and all that. And they're like, well, everything seems fine. Then, okay, well then why do I keep doing it? Why do I keep feeling that there's pressure in my ear? Well, is it because you're tinnitus? Probably, I don't know, you tell me doc, you're the doc, <laughs> right? Do I have tinnitus? Yeah, I got, you know, happens after you see, after you hear a couple of boom booms, you know? Uh, my dog's name is Jet. Jet? Yep, right Jet? Jet. Yeah, the people that that, uh, that sponsored him, his name is Jet, uh, they named him Jet. So whoever donates the money to train the dog, they get to name him, so like the military Jet. So it's not, it's not a name for, that I gave him, it's the name that the organization Canine for Warriors gave him. There you go, that's a good boy Jet, that's right. Yeah, this dog, um, he's like a kid. That's why I'll never have a kid. He's, he's like a kid. He always wants to be with me. Like if I don't go anywhere, he'll literally start barking. Uh, he calms me down quite a bit. I mean, if I ever get mad at anything, I'll just look over at him and he'll like look at me with that cute, silly dog face. And I'll just be like, oh, it's not that bad. 
right, Jay? I remember I waited close to three years. It would have been two, but COVID happened right in the middle of it. So that's what delayed it like a whole extra year because of COVID. Um, but I remember it was, I, I, I applied and I had to submit like all my, my, my VA paperwork. I had to sit my, I had to have like my psychiatrist sign off on it. I had to have my therapist sign off on it. I had to have my primary care doctor sign off on it. So all three of them had to match to show them that, Hey, I'm not just bullshitting my way through this to get a service dog. Like I actually have genuine need. And he, by the way, these are three professionals in the field all that are certified and licensed that confirm my diagnosis, right? So once I got all that, they flew me out to um, to Florida to, to get the dog. It was 21 days and I met him for the first time. It was interesting. So he was like very, very playful. And I remember my first time I met him, um, we were in this big ass yard and I was playing with him and he was like running and running and running and running and running. And he was running towards me and I thought he was gonna stop, but he didn't stop. So he literally hits my, hits my shin at full force. He's, a, he's an 80-pound dog. He's a heavy-ass dog. So I did a somersault. My first time I met him, like, probably not even five minutes, right? It was my fault for goading him on, but I didn't think he was actually going to run into me like that. Even though he's a service dog, I sometimes forget when he's playing, he's still a dog, <laughs> right? So um, he runs into me. I do a full-fledged somersault, and I, and I land on my ass. And I remember he felt, I remember he specifically went over and started licking my face because he was so, he felt so bad that he hit me. At least that's what I like to think he's thinking. It took a little bit a little bit to get used to, but probably like around day 15, day 20, he started to really get attached. And that I remember on the very first day that I got home, I had to go somewhere and I didn't really want to bring him because I was going to be gone for like maybe five, 10 minutes tops. I leave, I come back and I have a, I have a uh, my, my glass in one of my rooms is broken and the screen is on the outside. So I thought, shit, did I just get broken into? So. I cleared the house with my, with my gun because at this point I'm like, I don't know what's going on. I didn't think I got broken into, but then again, I, you know, you never know. It's a good neighborhood, but you never know, right? So I clear my house because I don't see anything in there. No, nothing's happening. And my next question is, shit, where's my dog? Oh, shit, where's my cat? Because I also have a cat and they didn't actually get along. So I thought my dog ate my cat. So I find the cat hiding under the bed. So I'm like, oh, cool. The cat's alive. Cat's good. All right, we're good. Go on to the dog. Couldn't find the dog. Turns out, what he did was, even though I closed all the all the rooms in, in the living room and I closed all the windows, he chewed through a uh, a metal doorknob. He chewed it off. He chewed a metal doorknob off a door. And he broke into one of my rooms trying to find me as I left. And by the way, I've only been in, Cal I've, this is after the 21 days. I haven't even been in California for like seven hours yet. I'm like, let me just leave him home real quick. I'll leave him in the living room. He'll be fine, right? He literally take. there's a little bit of blood on, on, on the windshield because he literally took his nose and he pushed. The, it was a little bit of crack, but it was enough to where he clawed it open. And he busted out the window and he cut himself on the broken glass. But he got out of the house. He broke a glass and got out of the house. And what he did was he went over to our neighbor's house, which was the only person he's ever met since he'd been in California. He, go, he parks and pins his butt in front of the, the front door and barks until they open. So he walks inside. I'm literally driving around like a crazy person for two hours trying to find this dog. And um, I see this other guy walking around this dog on a blue leash. And he goes, this is your dog? I'm like, yes, where the hell did you find him? Oh, he's been waiting in front of our door for the last, you know, for however long. And as soon as I open the door, he walk, he runs right in. And I was like, oh, thank God he found the dog. I bought a crate after that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was, he has, he had like major, it's so bad to where now if I ever have to leave him, like for a long period, because I just can't bring them. It's just not feasible. Like, like if I'm going on like a cruise, I'm not going to bring a dog, right? So I have people watch him, but because I'm not there, I also have to give him some some medication to calm him down. Because he, this guy is like super anxious. Like he, I can see why he's a service dog, because he needs to be with his person, mm. right? Because he's always like, he's always with me. But at the same time, if he separates from me, his, his anxiety goes up. So I feel like I'm his service dog just as much as he's mine. Right? Uh, it's canine for warriors. Yeah, so it's free. So if you're like a veteran and you want to get that, it's, it's all fully covered. Uh, you don't pay for anything. 21 days, all the, all the meals that are provided to you are, are cooked for, for, for you by volunteers. At least that's what they tell me. But the place is super nice. The whole compound was built by, by, by donated materials. So I have my own company, Century Institute. So what we primarily focus on is security certifications, security certifications, firearm certifications, concealed carry weapons, stuff like that. We've been doing it for about four, a little over four years now. Doing pretty, pretty, pretty good for, for, for right now, you know, like planning on retiring soon. I finally, like I said, you know, have a beautiful fiance I'm about to marry, you know, it only took 40 years, but hey, well, 
better late than never. My headspace is in a lot better space than where it, where it, where it was when I first came back. And it was, um, and when I say it was like 10 years of like literal hell, it's probably accurate. You know, going from at a time where I probably contemplated suicide at least once or twice a year for the first few years, uh, to seeing some of my own people that, I, some of the people that I know of in my unit and not in my unit um, that, that I've served with overseas that committed suicide. You know, it, it's, it's, it's tough. Even, even seeing one of my, the, the friends that I served with, um, um, Officer Ryan Bonaminio, he was a Riverside police officer that was killed with his own gun while he was pursuing a, a, an escaped felon. It was all over the news. I think there's a park named after him in Riverside right now. So I served with him uh, in the first tour. You know, right now things are going okay. Planning on just living out the rest of my life and do me and be with this dog right here.